Hi, everyone. I am Steph Hutka, founder and head of design research at Sendful, a consultancy helping people build useful and usable products for anticipated markets. A very quick note on me before Sendful, I was at Meta Reality Labs, at Adobe, and then before that, Daiquiri, AR startup. Show of hands, do folks remember Daiquiri? I feel like this audience, yes. <laughs> nice. And then before that, a cognitive neuroscience PhD at University of Toronto, and I'll talk more about all of this. Uh, but let's, uh, let's dive in. Like, how many folks here, show of hands, have met a design researcher before? Okay, so maybe non-trivial minority. I'll do a very quick, uh, uh, quick summary of what that role entails. The systematic study of people's behaviors and attitudes in service of building tools that are, are solving people problems and are also usable. Very quick. Uh, so if we can, oh, I have the control of the clicker. That's right, cool. So I often like to introduce myself as a design researcher asking questions about the future of human cognition. Cognition here being defined as all forms of knowing and awareness, such as remembering, reasoning, and imagining. So let's go back into that past that I mentioned. So why am I interested in the future of human cognition? Me on the left here, this is me during my graduate studies. I'm wearing an electroencephalography or EEG cap while playing the violin. I was studying auditory processing, a uh, really, uh, really specific area of neuroscience. Little did I know that all that deep diving into sensation, perception, cognition would serve me well in a career in extended reality and design research, but I'm jumping ahead a little bit. So grad school, then I go over to Daiquiri as a research science, scientist working on brain-computer interfaces, doing sensor validation for this helmet device here. I think I can point here. This is the Daiquiri smart helmet. We were looking for how we could integrate sensors in here. And then kind of through that work, started working with designers, writing up patents, and learned about the world of design and user experience. Folks were trying to figure out questions like, how do we design lists and menus in this new world of spatial depth and moving beyond our 2D graphical user interfaces? So all of this got me interested in this intersection of cognition by UXR by XR, all the Rs. So everyone here uh, will be really familiar with this intersection of XR and AI. Last year, we heard Ori Inbar's keynote, XR is the interface for AI. Since then, we've seen lots of news articles, announcements, Ray-Ban Meta, wearables where you can query the glasses, what am I looking at? Maybe it's the, the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco and you'll, you'll, uh, you'll learn what you're looking at. Brilliant Labs is frames and all examples of this. And of course, this year's keynote, AI Hearts XR in, in Ori's keynote. So I've been tracking this overlap and really interested in sort of the effects of of these technologies on human cognition. So let's keep rolling. So as XR and AI become increasingly intertwined, we have the potential to extend human cognition in a way that was previously impossible. So let me break that down a little bit. So how can XR extend human cognition? So I'll do a very quick run through of what is embodied cognition and then applying that to XR. So in this diagram here, we have cognition at the center, and then we have a couple of different systems, perceptual system, sensory system, uh, motor system. I know we have some neuroscientists in the room. This is a, definitely a, a simplification, uh, but I'll illustrate what's going on in this, this diagram with an example. Let's say you are catching a ball. So your eyes are detecting shape and color. Uh, so this is your sensory system. Your brain's recognizing all these signals coming towards you as a ball. Uh, this is now you're perceiving that ball. The brain's using this information to decide what action to take, uh, your cognition, and then the motor system sending signals that you need to go out and catch that ball. And as your hand moves, you get this continuous sensory feedback, uh, updating that perceptual system and cognition, and all of this is happening in the backdrop of a given environment. So the key point here is that cognition is not solely a brain-bound uh, phenomenon, but is distributed across our entire bodily experience. So this being embodied cognition. Let's tie this back to kind of how this might, we might extend cognition with XR. So I'll be talking a little bit about these superpowers, what is really maybe special or unique about uh, a given technology. Uh, this is not the only superpower of XR, but these, the potential for these natural embodied interactions is one of the superpowers of XR. So 
let's keep, keep going with our plot because the plot is about to get even thicker. Uh, so, so now talking about application of embodied cognition uh, from uh, you know, applying that to extended reality. So this is your brain on space. So I, the point I'm trying to make, that I'll be making here, is that spatial digital content is fundamentally different from how we interact with 2D digital content, for example, on laptops or smartphones. So what is going on in this diagram here? So this person here within you know, the space that you are generally <laughs> inhabiting as a person, we can call this personal space. The distance within reaching or grasping distance is peripersonal space, and then extrapersonal space, the, the distance beyond that grasping uh, distance. Cognitive neuroscience research has shown that we can actually remap these zones via our use of physical objects, also known as tools. So for example, someone using a stick to interact with the environment, over time, the space that would previously have been considered extrapersonal now becomes peripersonal. So let me just get this linked up here, perfect. So we can even remap how we represent our bodies in space. If we play this video, here, it'll show something called the rubber hand illusion. Let's see, if it's not playing, I can tell you what will, what will happen. So rubber hand illusion, uh, oh, perfect. Show of hands, have folks heard of this before? Okay, y'all know what's generally happening here. Rubber hand illusion, perceptual illusion, which participants receive a physical rubber hand. There is simultaneous multi-sensory stimulation of the, of the rubber hand and of the physical hand. And after time, the person in this uh, illusion starts to, to feel that this rubber hand is a representation essentially of their body. And we can replicate this in extended reality, uh, in uh, mixed reality, virtual reality. Fun fact, how far does this go? Uh, there's research by uh, Kateni and colleagues, a paper from 2012, uh, showing that a virtual arm up to three times the length of a person's given arm is how far you can extend. So, so fun, fun fact, uh, hold on, let's get Passes this YouTube, uh, YouTube ad here. So TLDR, XR, creates this new layer of reality onto which we can extend our cognition. So hanging on to that for a second. Now enter Gen AI. Y'all have probably seen uh, this graph before. I like this graph because it conveys, even though it's spe specifically focused on the growth of ChatGPT compared to other uh, famous technology tool incumbents like Instagram and Spotify, the number of users on the y-axis and the number of days to adopt. And so what we saw with ChatGPT is that in less than two months, we had 100 million users. So this is this, this example of this disruptive technology that is displacing existing markets, creating new ones at exponential rates. So as these systems grow, they're also becoming increasingly capable of quote unquote uh, thinking tasks. Look no further than ChatGPT 4.0's recent launch. Uh, the system can help you think through math problems. Uh, you can adopt a personality of your choosing, uh, converse through uh, multimodal input and receive multimodal output. And all of this is happening in real time with latency that is comparable to conversational uh, turn taking. So how can Gen AI extend human cognition? We looked at this a little bit with, with extended reality, so let's talk about what is happening with Gen AI. So to answer this question, I want to introduce cognitive offloading, this cognitive, neuro, uh, this, uh, cognitive science concept, effectively delegating our cognition to technology. And this is not new to Gen AI. We've been doing this for years and years with our technology. I am terrible at navigating in either a familiar city or a, uh, or a new city because I have cognitively offloaded that navigation ability to my navigation apps, like, for example, Google Maps. So this cognitive offloading kind of goes into 10x mode uh, with AI technologies that can do these quote unquote thinking things and you know, some examples of this acting as a sparring partner when you're writing a document uh, or maybe you know, summarizing our meeting notes if you've used you know, tools like that. So kind of going down to the, the next level here. So as AI distributes these increasingly advanced uh, uh, cognitions to technology, uh, we're essentially distributing our cognition to these technology tools. So AI for radiology might be a great example of what this distributed cognition looks like. AI-powered tools analyze medical scans for anomalies with really high accuracies. Radiologists will review these scans, helping them make quicker and more accurate diagnoses. And so you're distributing this cognitive load between experts and the tool. 
So now looking at kind of extension of human cognition with Gen AI. So Gen AI enables this offloading and distributing of these increasingly uh, cognitive tasks. So let's look at what some potential futures might look like. Note I'm just have like this optimistic tone, like all of these cool things. There'll, there'll be, there'll be, a, there'll be a, a word of caution in a sec. So you know, what does a potential uh, future or futures look like at this overlap? So some potential futures that we might see are this real-time multimodal interactions uh, that allow us to accomplish tasks via XR wearables. So the UX impact of this might be more intuitive interactions. So this could be gestures or using natural uh, voice input to query you know, what you're looking at. Like in the Ray-Ban example, we're already starting to see this with some of our wearables. We might see this intersection, this increasing intersection of spatial and effective computing, which you might have heard of as emotional AI. Uh, so a good example of this are some learning tools, like Brainly starting to do this, where your AI system will adapt kind of based on your, your personal needs and depending on sort of what effective inputs, you'll have that adaptation based on your emotions. So kind of playing this in the, in, into the future, what this might look like in XR. So imagine you're really stressed working on a big deliverable. You have the spatial computing headset for, say, glasses that can detect stress based on speech or body movement or other physiological signals. And the device offers an ability to create this customized, relaxing digital cocoon for you, uh, offering uh, maybe subtle options to, to adapt your lighting uh, to kind of make that, uh, that environment a little bit more pleasing for you. So UX impact here, emotions become the user interface. The last potential uh, you know, prediction that I, I have here, potential future, is increased interoperability between our AI-enabled XR and non-XR um, uh, XR form factors. So this might look like responsive design, what we have now if you're designing for mobile and uh, web, where you have you know, this automatic scaling between tools. Like if you use a tool like you know, Squarespace, this automatically happens for you. So what does it look like if you're using a certain application on your phone? We're seeing this a lot with you know, Apple Vision Pro. If you're adapting mobile apps to spatial, what remains 2D, what remains 3D? And I think we're going to have a lot more uh, design patterns coming out of this as we figure out kind of what is the best thing to spatially translate. So all this is well and good, right? We can all go home my like 12 minutes back of your day, uh, except, you know, here be dragons. While these potential futures perhaps are exciting, uh, it's also really easy to build things that are not solving problems for people that aren't useful and are not desirable. So I like this quote by Paul Graham, uh, co-founder of Y Combinator. Gen AI is the exact opposite of a solution in search of a problem. It is a solution to far more problems than its developers ever knew existed. So I think this is a really interesting quote because it kind of captures some of the tension. So folks in, in UX or gen just generally, like we probably are all taught best practices, lead with the problem that you are solving with people. But here we have this momentum of the solution, this technology solution that is developing at this unparalleled uh, rate and kind of in in parallel to that, you're opening up new potential problems. We see analogs of this if we think of other uh, other technologies like like for the business model of Uber to exist, you kind of needed to have the iPhone come before it. So okay, you might just be like, all right, Steph, it's it's uh, disruptive, you know, innovation, cool, nothing to be worried about here. Except given, you know, I think this what we the the capabilities of Gen AI kind of raise the stakes in terms of these cognitive tasks. How do we choose which problems to focus on that can yield useful and desirable solutions for people? And given this increasing overlap of XR and AI, I think this affects everyone in this room. So this brings me to a new framework for building the, at this intersection of AI and XR to help us extend human cognition. So the first step, so I also i am an adjunct at Berkeley, and I teach intro to user experience design. And part of that is showing these, these foundational folks have heard of like the double diamond or design thinking and kind of these different, uh, different you know, potential uh, frameworks and, and mindsets of design. And as I was going through these and teaching my students and thinking about what's happening with XR, what's happened on any product launches that I've worked on, what's happening with AI, 
It's like it's not quite capturing what's going on. So I just started you know, sketching out what, how do we mirror that parallel evolution? Just like let's first map what, what's even going on here. Uh, so I, I sort of you know, I literally <laughs> sketched this out where we have uh, this problem space and solution space kind of evolving in parallel and where I see a huge opportunity for folks building these tools is these symbiosis touch points where we are informing uh, we're, 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 we're mindful of what the feasibility of the solution is, but we're also very mindful of what people problems that we are building for. So kind of what follows from, uh, from this view of this parallel development of solution and problem space is a toolkit for building AI and XR in ways that can help us extend human cognition. So there are three tools uh, that I'll be sharing with folks. One is around mapping problem ecosystems. So this is more on the problem space side. Uh, so identifying the potential range of problems one could be solving for, building intuition about our solution space. Gen AI is moving incredibly fast. We're seeing new collaboration models arise where we have ML researchers working closer than ever with design teams. There's a much tighter feedback loop than we've seen in, in uh, you know, past uh, technology application development. And then the last is a framework to help us think about how we can intentionally offload cognition. My view is cognitive offloading is not inherently bad. We just need to be intentional about what we are offloading. So first things first around mapping people ecosystems to uncover opportunities and risks. If I have any design researcher or UX folks in the room, you might, you know, something like this model might be uh, familiar. You see all these overlapping diagrams with a bunch of different stakeholders, kind of systems theory, ecosystems thinking. Uh, let me break down what's happening here. So traditionally with user experience, we have kind of one end user. If we think about the history of human computer interaction, this kind of makes sense. If we go back to sort of ENIAC, you know, World War II days, we had a giant system built for experts. They were built designing these systems for themselves. Then computers move into the home and workplace. Now we have the notion of an end user who is not the person building the system. Then we have you know, portable devices, we have our phones, et cetera. Uh, now there's this idea of building something that's engaging and exciting, enter user experience. But we're now in this world where we're generally building platforms or systems, much more complex, uh, you know, complex entities. And, and my argument is this requires more of this ecosystem uh, thinking. This can be challenging for product teams. I've heard this myself, like we want one persona stuff, like who are we building for? But you, know, you, can, you can have that at the end of the day to help guide your product development. But before you get there, I really encourage mapping out a little bit more comprehensively the different potential stakeholders in your ecosystem. So if you're building, say, a consumer product, uh, you, you know, if you're building glasses, end user might be the person who is wearing said glasses. But there's a lot of other folks in this broader ecosystem who are affected. You'll have bystanders. You'll have developers like the creator, creator ecosystem. You'll have policymakers, certainly extremely relevant with AI right now. And then business stakeholders, the folks who might even be internal to your company. And what I encourage, you can do this, you know, depending on your team size, this can just be a conversation, this can be run as a workshop, where you're identifying kind of what, what do we know about the values and incentives of each of these bubbles, are we missing any bubbles, and talking through sort of what are the opportunities and risks for each of these bubbles. So to give an example, uh, I know we all know about how Google Glass and the challenges around social acceptability and adoption, and it's, it's an, an oversimplification to say, you know, if we just built for bystanders, all the problems with you know, Google Glass adoption would have gone away. But I just encourage us to think about a potential future in which like, the person we were designing for was actually the bystander. That was the person on the persona board. You know, what might have that outcome uh, look like? So when we're entering this gnar sort of gnarly world of uh, offloading these increasingly complex thinking tasks, taking this kind of ecosystem view of whom we're building for as a first step. Then the second one is around developing intuition around our, our Gen AI technologies. This is something I've been doing as an analog in XR for a long time as I moved from doing leading design research for enterprise uh, folks at Daiquiri, then, then moving to thinking about artists and designers at, at Adobe building XR experiences, and then consumer folks at Meta. I, I spent a lot of time trying out all all the XR tools I could get my hands on, diving into business reports, and really just trying to get a sense of this. Oh, uh, yeah, sorry. Uh, get a sense of this broader landscape, and really trying to build intuition of the medium, like trying out different apps, kind of pressure testing them. 
And I think this is, the, we can apply this sort of analog to generative AI. Uh, Ethan Mollick, who's a, a professor at the Wharton Business School, encourages spending about 10 hours with one of the frontier models to really understand what it's capable of. And that really echoes my experience from the XR field, I think, as we move into to, you know, building more Gen AI tools and at this intersection of XR, you know, spending time interacting, maybe you're fine tuning a foundation model, but if you haven't spent a bunch of time understanding kind of the strengths and weaknesses of that model, like spending, spending hands on time, play testing as a team, maybe you assign a goal or a task that everyone tries to do and you kind of debrief at the end of it, you can make this kind of interactive session. Of course, collaborating really closely if you're working with data scientists or machine learning engineers, so you have a really tight feedback loop and forming a point of view on what are the superpowers of your tool. I like to joke, at least where we are now, I write this, this weekly blog newsletter. I'm like anyone worried about Gen AI being sentient, tell that to me trying to wrestle with the tool to generate a title image for like a half an hour and like reshape a hand. Uh, but, but you know, that I now have a good sense of sort of what might, use, what might some good use cases be for this, what are the limitations, what are the superpowers. Let's keep moving. So the last piece here of this toolkit is around intentionally offloading cognition. So this is, is relatively new. I've been thinking about kind of how do we combine this concept of what are superpowers with what, is, what are uh, tasks that people are either able to do or want to do. I think that's an important distinction, this aspect of desirability. Uh, so this matrix, so big picture here, this is a tool to help you think about what, uh, what sort of tasks you might want to offload. You can convert this into sort of what parts of the workflow might you want your technology to help fill in for people. So the, the, uh, I'll start with the x-axis here. We have human superpowers and XR by AI superpowers. I'm saying superpowers sounds all fun and, and flashy, but this is actually going back to uh, work by Paul J. Fitz, who was a leader in human computer, uh, uh, in human factors in the 50s. He had this list, the Fitz list, very creatively named, I know, uh, where the human, uh, like human, um, uh, like what are humans best suited at, best suited for, what are machines best suited for. So for example, detecting stimuli, you know, beyond perceptual thresholds, great op opportunity for machines. For people, anomaly detection, we see you know, machines struggle with this with self-driving cars. That's something that humans might be better at. So kind of taking that and adapting it for our modern technology, that's sort of where this x-axis comes, comes, comes to. So after you've spent some time building this intuition of your tools and then thinking also about if we've done some design research, thought through your stakeholders, you can start to get a handle of kind of maybe what are some of the tasks or use cases on the x-axis. And then on the y-axis, we have tasks people can or like to do or tasks people can't and dislike doing. So it might be helpful to walk through a potential example. So let's say there is a student using uh, AI-enabled AR glasses. So I'll start with kind of the top, uh, top left here. So for tasks that the student maybe uh, can, can do, or maybe likes to do, and what's a, a human superpower, critical thinking, you know, forming insightful hypotheses, maybe through your design research, you've learned that you know, this is something that this person finds really in, uh, energizing and, and it, they have a lot of conversations with their colleagues about this. Uh, so this is something, you know, I'm not saying you couldn't have AI and XR support here, but this is definitely not something you want to delegate to technology. Uh, maybe there's something that this, this person really doesn't like doing, like, uh, like uh, creating a prioritized study plan. Sounds kind of like grunt work, but they have all of the, let's say they have all of the relevant context about where they need to focus their entire course load, and right now might be challenging to compile all of that and put it into Gen AI. Potentially, we could argue about that. Uh, but, you know, again, maybe there's a way XR and AI could support, but there's something here that's kind of, you know, something that the, the human has kind of a leg up on. Now, I think it gets more interesting when we look at the right side here, in terms of, say, uh, uh, note taking. Let's say the student, this, I'm channeling myself here, I still, even when I have AI automa automated generated um, meeting notes, I still like taking notes during conversations of key points. It really helps me engage with the material. And so, you know, so note taking, if we've, oh, if we've learned, giving away my tagline here, uh, if we've learned from our design research that this is something, though we could offload this to machines, like let's say this is a common pattern across your, your findings, uh, this is not something we should, just because we can doesn't mean we should. This is something that, the, the, that you know, people, in this case are maybe our sample, hypothetically, still enjoys doing. Then we look at the bottom here around uh, this intersection of XR and AI superpowers and 
and uh, maybe tasks that people dislike doing. Maybe creating flashcards is something that's really helpful for the student, but it's, it's quite time consuming to do. Maybe there's an opportunity here, Jenny, I can help uh, generate these, these flashcards. Maybe they can port that from their phone onto their glasses and can study this you know, while they're commuting or something like that. So great candidate for delegating to technology. So putting this all together, uh, building useful, desirable XR by AI solutions starts with intentionally building to extend human cognition. And just a couple notes, we might have time for one or two questions, but if you're interested in this sort of stuff, I write every week on human-computer interaction as it intersects with XR and or AI. Uh, there's cognitive science, neuroscience, cultural anthropology peppered in there as well. This is just an example of the type of stuff I write about. It's on, you can find it through my website at Sendful, at Sendful. it's by Substack, where you can find the newsletter. And then if you wanna keep in touch with me, those are some good ways to do that. I think I'm at time. Great, thank you so much, Stephanie. If you guys have questions or anything for Stephanie, definitely uh, catch her as she's on her way down or in the hallway before the day closes today.